Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to start this important session, and uh, it's called, as I, it's called external perspectives. And the reason for that, and I go back to what I said in my opening remarks this morning, is that the large majority of uh, submissions on this topic of blasphemy were in favour of its abolition from the Constitution. But it, it is very important that the other side of this debate is also fully represented to the Convention members. So whereas we have, in the case of Atheist Ireland, the Humanist Association of Ireland and the Irish Council of Civil Liberties, we have three organizations who are clearly advocates for a particular point of view. We have, in addition, then, uh, other speakers who are not particularly ad necessarily advocates for abolition or for retention, but who are going to give a, a, a perspective, their perspective. And those two uh, uh, speakers will be Reverend Professor, Professor Patrick Pat Hannan from NUI Maynooth and Dr. Ali Selim of the Islamic Cultural Center of Ireland. And uh, I hope they're going to turn up. They're not here yet, but we, they, we, are, ex we are expecting them. And then we, we have Martin Gilligan, who is a, a PhD student for the, in the School of Natural Sciences, NUIG. And Martin attended our regional meeting on Wednesday evening and spoke from the floor and advocated the retention of the, of the current, of the status quo, basically. And we felt, because it was important that we had a voice arguing this, we invited Martin, and we were very grateful when he accepted in, sometime in the course of yesterday. Uh, he clearly hadn't been planning this before he went to the meeting last Wednesday night, or even perhaps subsequently, but we are grateful that Martin is going to speak from that perspective. So, we're going to kick it off, and I am going to have to be qu quite strict in, on timing uh, uh, for all the speakers. So uh, be between the uh, Atheist Ireland and the Humanist Asso Association of Ireland, they have 14 minutes, between, uh, but there are four speakers. And the first speaker, for, on behalf of Atheist Ireland, is Michael Nugent. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Michael Nugent, I'm chairperson of Atheist Ireland. Um, you have rights, but your beliefs do not, and that's the essence of freedom of conscience. You can respect my right to believe that there is no God without respecting the content of my belief, and I can respect your right to believe that there is a God without respecting the content of your belief. But blasphemy laws discriminate against atheists because they treat religious beliefs and sensitivities as more worthy of legal protection than atheist beliefs and sensitivities. For example, we were recently at a conference in Limerick on religious pluralism in education, at which two Catholic theologians told the conference that atheists are not fully human. The most recent edition, or a recent edition of the Catholic magazine Alive, quoted an article from The Telegraph, apparently without irony, saying that atheists live short, selfish, stunted little lives, often childless, before they approach hopeless death in despair and their worthless corpses are chucked in a trench. Now, that may be intended as satirical. Certainly the, the comment about not being fully human wasn't intended as satirical. But could you imagine the reaction if, a, if an atheist said that about religious people? But here's the point. We're not reacting with outrage. We're not insisting that a live magazine be banned or that uh, Catholic theologians be censored. We're happy to react in a more proportionate manner than by expressing outrage when people say things that are insensitive to what we believe. And we think that the constitution and law should encourage religious people to do the same rather than incentivizing expressions of outrage. It's also important to remember that blasphemy laws, as well as being discriminatory against atheists, affect religious people too. And Atheist Ireland campaigns internationally uh, for Christians and Muslims who are victims of blasphemy laws in mostly Islamic states. From the day that Ireland passed our blasphemy law, we've campaigned tirelessly against it. We've had public meetings, we've lobbied politicians, we've liaised with international human rights monitoring bodies. And while in Ireland we're kind of used to pretending that our laws don't mean what they say that they mean, and... Um, most people are kind of bemused to even discover that we have a blasphemy law, but internationally, 
where people take laws at face value, we find that people are astounded to hear that a modern Western democracy has passed a new blasphemy law in the 21st century. And they ask us, do we not realize that passing this law is giving political support to the Islamic states who infringe on human rights through blasphemy laws and who use the Irish law as part justification of the United Nations. And you were told earlier on, just a few moments ago by an expert, that that, that was a misquote. It's not a misquote. Pakistan cited the Irish definition of blasphemy law as what they wanted implemented internationally in its proposals to the ad hoc committee on the elaboration of complementary standards in its call for an international instrument preventing the defamation of religion at the United Nations. That is happening, it's not just in Pakistan. Islamic states are using the Irish defamation law, or, uh, uh, blasphemy law as an example of it being normal to have such laws. And when we tell such people that it is our constitution that requires us to have a law against blasphemy, they ask us when and how we can change that clause in our constitution. And the answer to that is here and now. You today have a unique opportunity as members of this convention to recommend to the Irish government that we replace this anachronism with a positive expression of freedom of expression uh, based on Article 10 of the European Convention of Human Rights. Please read our written submission, which we sent to our website for, for uh, more details. And I'll ask David Nash and Jane Donnelly to elaborate further. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Professor David Nash of Oxford Brookes University. I've researched and published on blasphemy for 20 years, and I've advised a number of Western governments for approximately 10 years, notably governments in the United Kingdom and Australia. Very, very few countries still have blasphemy laws as blasphemy laws, rather than religious hatred laws. And these are generally, in the West, the remnant of much older laws and the attitudes to religion in the state that go with these. But as we know, Ireland's constitutional requirements have now led to a new law. And this is really the only newly constructed modern law in the West. As such, this is very much a significant break with past laws. And also, it should be remembered, past laws in Ireland itself. Now, although there have been no prosecutions in Ireland, it's clear that this law has victims beyond these shores. As other countries actively cite and view Ireland's law as a prece precedent with which to persecute both the religious and non-religious in their own societies. Now, it's precisely this which has led the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion, Professor Heiner Bielefeld, to liaise with me and to request reports from me on the situation in Ireland. This is in recognition of the potential impact of Ireland's law upon other nations. And he has actively asked me to pass on this message to you the members of this convention. Quote, there is a growing consensus within the human rights community that we have to move away from anti-blasphemy laws, which, as countless examples demonstrate, generally have intimidating effects on religious belief minorities, dissenters, converts, and others. Rather than resorting to blasphemy legislation, what we ought to do is try to overcome stereotypes and prejudices by enhancing interreligious and intercultural communication." Unquote. So, Professor Bielefeld, myself and others request the removal of Ireland's constitutional requirement to have this law, thus ending the damage it currently does to the secular and religious life of, uh, of this and other nations. Um, good afternoon. I'm Jane Donnelly, Human Rights Officer of Atheist Ireland. Asia Noren Bibi is the face of blasphemy laws. She's a 45-year-old Christian mother from Pakistan who faces execution by hanging after being convicted of blasphemy 
and two politicians who supported her have been mur murdered for doing so. In April 2009, Dermot O'Hearn told the Dáil that the Irish Constitution obliged him to introduce a new law against blasphemy. Two months later, in June 2009, in Pakistan, Asiya Bibi went to fetch water while picking fruits in the fields near her village. Some Muslim co-workers objected to Asiya touching the water bowl because she was a Christian and therefore unclean. Five days later, her co-workers claimed that Asiya had made critical comments about Muhammad and a mob gathered to punish her. Asiya was convicted of blasphemy and sentenced to hang. When the governor of Punjab questioned her conviction, he was murdered by one of his own bodyguards. The minorities minister in the government, a Christian, defended her and he was murdered too. We in Atheist Ireland, along with other human rights campaigners, have sought the release of Asia Bibi and other such victims. We are regularly told that we in Ireland have just passed our own new blasphemy law, so why are we complaining about theirs? During all of this, the Pakistani government was leading the Islamic states at the United Nations in calling for an extension of blasphemy laws around the world, using wording taken directly from Ireland's new blasphemy laws. In today's world, our, world, our actions in Ireland affect real people elsewhere. Please send a message to Sia Bibi, the face of blasphemy laws, and to her captors by voting to remove the blasphemy clause from our constitution. Thank you. The Humanist Association of Ireland is an organisation that aims to promote the ideals of humanism and assure the equality of rights and parity of esteem for those citizens of Ireland who do not subscribe to religion. Humanism is a positive ethical philosophy of life based on concern for humanity in general and individu individuals in particular. This convention is now dealing with the offence of blasphemy. In a free society, freedom of expression is one of the most basic and cherished rights and free exchange of ideas, including criticism, is a fundamental element in human development. Blasphemy laws violate this right. Blasphemy laws inherently stifle serious discussion, discussion and criticism of ideas and beliefs. They are discriminatory as they aim to protect the beliefs of a select group among our society at the expense of other people's freedom of speech and freedom of expression. They give greater precedence to beliefs held by religious over the beliefs of the non-religious. They can even infringe upon a person's freedom of religion as differing religious beliefs are often concerned, uh, considered mutually blasphemous. <coughs> Blasphemy laws are often abused, leading to arbitrary arrests and imprisonments. They are also used to silence dissenters, political opponents, and religious minorities. The blasphemy law cannot be applied to ensure freedom of religion, or it will be applied in a discriminatory manner, where the beliefs of one religion are protected, whereas the others are silenced. In such situations, preferential treatment is often shown towards the dominant religion. Retention of the offence of blasphemy will cause the state to educate between what is sacred to one belief system, but not to another. The state should not be in the business of passing judgment on the theological merits of religious beliefs. Blasphemy laws are often condemned internationally. Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights states that everyone has a right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. Blasphemy laws are in direct conflict with this ideal. Blasphemy laws are clearly in violation of Article 14 of the European Convention of Human Rights. Uh, which prohibits against discrimination. Um, in short, no religious or philosophical beliefs could be protected from rigorous, should be protected from rigorous criticism and challenge. And religious beliefs should enjoy no extra protection compared with non-religious non beliefs. The Humanist Association of Ireland calls upon the Convention to correct this anomaly and vote to remove the offence of blasphemy from the Irish Constitution. Good afternoon. The ICCL works to promote and protect all rights, including freedom of religion, freedom of expression, and freedom from discrimination. In the conduct of this debate, some effort is made to situate 
blasphemy laws as a proportionate restriction on, freedom, on free speech, permissible under the European Convention on Human Rights, and arising from that as a relevant method of preventing insult or offence regarding matters considered sacred to people of faith. Three cases which came before the Strasbourg Court are cited as particularly relevant in your materials. The first two, Otto Preminger Institute against Austria and Wingrove against the United Kingdom, concern actions taken by states to restrict the public performance of films which were labelled as blasphemous. The third, IAV Turkey, concerned a book which was deemed to be insulting to the Islamic faith. In all three cases, the court said that the restrictions imposed on the public performance or distribution of this material did not violate Article 10 of the Convention, which protects freedom of expression. In other words, the states in these cases had a wide margin to place restrictions in order to protect certain moral standards relevant to them. The implicit conclusion drawn is that blasphemy laws generally get a thumbs up from the body charged with upholding human rights in Europe. The reality is somewhat more nuanced. In deciding whether or not a restriction to freedom of expression is justified, the court applies a three-stage test. Firstly, it is, the is the restriction set out in law? Well, in our case, yes. Does it have a legitimate aim? Example, to preserve existing morals from an egregious assault or to protect the rights of others. This may be arguable. Thirdly, is it necessary in a democratic society? Here the court has stated that the flexibility afforded to states is not unlimited. Not only has the court determined that religious believers must be prepared to accept a level of blasphemy will occur, as it did more recently in Tatlov v Turkey, any interference must correspond to a pressing social need. This means the measures to enforce the restrictions must be proportionate, and the reasons given by the state to justify the restrictions uh, must be relevant and sufficient, and the court will examine this in the context of international and domestic evidence. It is at this point that the issues underlying the current, the current debate emerge. Focusing on the question of whether a law against blasphemy is or is not compatible with international human rights standards, such as freedom of expression, papers over as a, sig a significant and fundamental crack at the heart of this debate. Ireland has no use for a prohibition on blasphemy. This is certainly true of the current law, with its potentially enormous and grossly disproportionate fine of up to 25,000 euros. It is a measure to advance the rights of people. It is as a measure to advance the rights of people of faith, probably unworkable, largely unenforceable, and wholly unnecessary. Indeed, Section 36 of the Defamation Act has never actually been used. In fact, with the exception of the Corway case mentioned this morning, there appears to have been no case based on Article 40.6.1 in relation to blasphemy since the enactment of this constitution. We do not now, nor will we ever need a law on blasphemy to regulate, deter, or punish would-be perpetrators of offences against persons or the public order based on bigotry, incitement to hatred, discrimination, and other forms of intolerance, including hatred motivated by religious intolerance. This can be adequately accomplished within existing legal frameworks, albeit with some necessary modification. Such laws are designed to protect individuals, not ideologies. <clears throat> well, good afternoon. Uh, what you just heard was effectively the counter argument to an argument that you may not be hearing from people who are in favor of keeping blasphemy, but in particular targeted at giving you um, the counter case to some of what is said in written submissions, in particular from the uh, Knights of Columbanus. That, so much for the um, domestic setting. I want to move on and look a little bit at the, the international setting. What was the effect, in particular, back in 2009 when uh, legislation was introduced in this country? which activated uh, a provision in the Constitution, the one that you're looking at today. And the effect was of international embarrassment because it happened precisely at a moment when, on the international level, 
nation states, experts, civil society, and people of faith were looking at how could they strike a more appropriate balance between the competing rights that are at play when you talk about this difficult subject. And what happened in 2009 was that Ireland became a member of a very small club that you've heard a little bit about today, um, Egypt, uh, Iran, Pakistan, another country mentioned in, in some detail, that have actively criminalized blasphemy. And as we're going to see in the next couple of minutes, to do that, to take the action to do that, runs exactly in the opposite direction from the um, direction of international reform on this subject. Uh, the introduction of what David Nash called a newly constructed law in a Western European country was really completely unprecedented. Now, I said that international developments go precisely in the opposite direction, and there's a good reason for that, and it comes back to a question which was uh, asked from the floor this morning by Ivana Bacic, which is, is there a better way to do this? Can you better protect people of faith who might be subject to, to unwarranted abuse or attack or, or violence? Uh, and we would submit to you that absolutely there is. There's a far better way to draw this demarcation line between freedom of expression and incitement to hatred. And I want to briefly touch upon three recent developments at the international level that help us to do that. Uh, a resolution of the UN Human Rights Council from back in uh, 2011, the Istanbul process, which came out of that resolution, and something called the uh, Rabat Plan of, of Action. Um, firstly, a, a resolution of the United Nations Human Rights Council. The title, I think, um, if you take a moment to read it, of that resolution makes very clear what the intent is. And it is precisely to address, in a meaningful way, some of the concerns that we've been hearing here today, some of the concerns that we were hearing as being reflected in discussions that you had at your roundtable session after the first session this morning, which is how do you better protect people of faith in a way that also respects freedom of expression? Um, this resolution, which was passed by the UN Human Rights Council, uh, led to something called the Istanbul Process. And the Istanbul process was kicked off really by three major actors on the international scene. The initiative, uh, at the, it was the initiative of the Organization of the Islamic Conference, or OIC. Um, we heard this morning from Neville Cox a little bit about the, the OIC. Very significant um, international organization working in this area and crucially in this context, a counterweight to the allegation that is sometimes thrown at human rights advocates that um, we are simply carrying Western values or Western European values. They were at the outset involved in this initiative together with the EU High Representative for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, Cathy Ashton, and US Secretary of State at the time, Hillary Clinton. And what they did was they kicked off a process of um, consultation uh, in a range of different cities around the world where they brought together experts to think about these subjects. They're listed there for you. And there are some emerging action points that I want to share with you. These come both from the uh, UN Human Rights Council resolution um, and also from the discussions that they've been having within the Istanbul process. And they are essentially threefold, that there may be a need to adopt measures to criminalize incitement to imminent violence based on religion or belief. And I stress the word imminent. Uh, there, there must be an imminent risk, so it's very tightly drawn. Uh, there is a need to understand uh, the need to combat denigration and negative religious stereotyping. And lastly, and I think crucially, there's a need to recognize the value of open, constructive, and respectful debate and interfaith and intercultural dialogue. In other words, precisely the sort of exchanges that you are having uh, in the Convention on the Constitution today. Lastly, uh, 30 seconds on the uh, Rabat plan of 
action. Again, the title tells you very clearly what this is about. This is a United Nations generated process, a global process um, in which uh, in Europe, Africa, Asia Pacific and the Americas, people have been coming together to discuss precisely the sort of issues that you're looking at today. Um, and again, uh, a consensus uh, is emerging, a set of recommendations, comprehensive anti-discrimination national legislation with preventative and punitive action to effectively combat incitement to hatred, as well as the empowerment of minorities and vulnerable groups. And I'm going to leave you with just one recommendation from the uh, Rabat Plan of Action which is this one. Um, and I would submit to you that this is the single best reason that you will hear, I think, today why the um, blasphemy provision should be removed from the Irish um, Constitution, which is that blasphemy laws should be repealed because they have a stifling impact on the enjoyment of freedom of religion and belief and healthy dialogue and debate um, about religion. In other words, they stifle and they restrict the very thing that they claim that they protect. Um, so we would ask you to repeal that provision in the Irish Constitution. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, that was Mark Kelly, uh, and before him, Stephen O'Hare from the Irish Council of Civil Liberties, and before that, Peter Ferguson, the Humanist Association of Ireland. Before that, Michael Nugent, David Nash, and Jane Donnelly from the Atheist Ireland, Atheist Ireland. And I want to thank them for uh, to coming in in time, as, as, as they were asked to do. Now, firstly, my apologies for fiddling with my phone there a while ago, but the reason was I was get, just picking up a message from uh, Reverend Professor Pat Hannan to say he's had a slight accident on his way here. It's, I don't think it's anything serious, but it, it does mean he won't be here. So I'm sorry this is uh, one, um, uh, one voice that we won't be hearing this evening. He, he, it, he did say he will send in a written submission. But we are very delighted to have Dr. Ali Sel Selim of the Islamic Cultural Centre of Ireland. And it's really important, we felt, that we would have a voice from the Islamic community here in Ireland, and we're particularly pleased that you, sir, have agreed to be that voice. Good afternoon, everybody. Religion deemed of indispensable significance for many people is a belief system that uses symbols to enable people to explore and develop their spirituality which is considered substantially an essential component of human beings, the thirst of which, if not quenched, the viability of man's happiness in this earth is inevitably unattainable. Religion promotes peace. Religion promotes peaceful coexistence in the society, as most religions promote peace and harmony. Religions are pro-life, since life has a sound doctrinal value. Religion dictates how one is expected to live with others in harmony and peace. It sets the basic norms and customs of society. Religion teaches us about God. <clears throat> Religion reinforces the collective conscious in a world where tragedy is the norm. Religion gives us the reason. Religion gives us the purpose. Nevertheless, the place of religion in society has become increasingly contentious in recent years. Despite the fact that there is a divergence when it comes to the definition of the word religion, and despite the fact that there are various religions Believers of all faiths consensually state that certain aspects of their religions are holy and hence should be respected by others. This respect, deemed a fundamental component of coexistence and social mutuality and reciprocation, does not entail sharing others' belief, but simply not offending the believers in this regard. According to Islam, God 
angels, holy scriptures, prophets, disciples, O companions, and places of worship are to be protected by the state against any publication or utterance of blasphemous matter. At this point, it should be highlighted that Islam advocates freedom of expression. Nevertheless, there is a major difference between the way Islam advocates freedom of expression and today's advocates of freedom of expression. Since the first promotes principles of uniting mankind and cultivating love and understanding among all mankind, and thus creating a healthy atmosphere for coexistence. Whereas the latter advocates individualism. In order to achieve this, Islam instructs Muslims to be truthful. In chapter 33, verse 7, the Quran reads, Ya ayyuha ladheena amanu, attaqu allaha wa qulu qawlan sadeeda. O you who believe, be conscious of God and speak rightly. Islam instructs Muslims to do good. In chapter 22, verse 77, the Quran reads, Ya ayyuha ladheena amanu, irka'u wa sjudu wa abudu allaha wa fa'alu al-khayra la'allakum tuflihoon. O people who believe, Bow and prostrate yourself and worship your Lord and do good deeds in the hope of attaining salvation. Islam guarantees to all people, regardless of their faith and their race, the right of disagreement. In chapter 110, verse 6, the Quran reads, Lakum dinukum waliyadin, for you be your way and for me be mine. In fact, it encourages people to make up their own minds applying their mental faculties. In chapter 2, verse 256, the Quran reads, La ikraha fid deen, let there be no compulsion in the religion. Islam is pro-freedom of expression, but it preempts fractions by prescribing certain rules of conduct, which guarantees for all people freedom of expression as well as justice and the right to disagree. Unlike today's advocates of unrestrained freedom of expression, who cultivate confrontation and antagonism, leading to provocation of every kind, Islam instructs Muslims to refrain from inappropriate speech. In chapter 4, verse 148, the Quran reads, لا يحب الله الجهر بالسوء إلا من ظلم Allah does not like disclosure of evil matters. At this point, it should be highlighted that academic papers and scientific works should not be criminalized, provided that they are, gener they are not generated by prejudice and they do not apply offensive language. Mocking at religious values should not be tolerated. Hence, we should be grateful to the Irish constitution that protects peaceful coexistence. Article 40.6.1 of the Constitution protects freedom of expression and at the same time protects religions by providing for an offense of blasphemy in the following terms. The publication or utterance of blasphemous, seditious, or indecent matter is an offense which shall be punishable in accordance with the law. The above mentioned philosophy of Islam gave existence to a phalanx who accused Islam of being anti-freedom of expression, or state that Islam censors freedom of expression. This is a clear fallacy. Islam preaches responsible freedom of expression, but Islam is against irresponsible freedom of expression. The Danish cartoon, for instance, created rift domestically and internationally Members of one and the same, one of the one and the same country, they became enemies. Muslims called for international boycott of the Danish cartoon of the Danish products, and I wonder, what common good did the Danish cartoon achieve? The case of the Crowe vs. the Independent newspaper concerned a cartoon which depicted the politicians walking away from a priest offering a holy communion in a play 
on the wording of a particular no campaign in the 1995 divorce referendum slogan, it stated, hello progress, bye bye father. <clears throat> the applicant sought leave to mount a prosecution for blasphemously bill on the basis that the cartoon was calculated to insult the feelings and religious convictions of Catholic readers by treating the sacraments of the Eucharist and its administration as objects of scorn and derision. And I wonder, what common good did it achieve? Many may argue that it is the privilege of freedom of expression, but we argue that the right of freedom of expression, just like all other rights, should be expressed responsibly. Your freedom ends where mine starts, and mine ends where yours start. Our society should be a society of principles and then privileges, and not a society of privileges and then principles. So I hope we keep that legislation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ali Salim. And now again, I introduce uh, Martin uh, Gilligan, who is, as I said, a PhD student uh, in, in NUIG and who is a, an advocate for the retention of the current situation. Martin, please. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Martin Gilligan, and uh, as was mentioned, I'm from NUI Galway, but I'm speaking here as in a personal capacity. Uh, I'm a student of the School of Natural Sciences, which may seem strange that somebody from a scientific background is arguing uh, in defense of retaining this uh, blasphemy uh, measure within the Constitution. But I think it's uh, crucially important that the only guarantor we have of religious uh, tolerance in this country uh, is retained. Um, religion does not fuel war, but religious intolerance does, as it is fueling the wars right across the Middle East, as it has fueled centuries of oppression on this island. I think it's worth remembering that just a hundred years before that constitution was written, it was not possible for a Roman Catholic to hold public office. When it was written in the 1930s, it was written in consultation with all major denominations on the island, including the chief rabbi of Ireland. Um, again, bear in mind what was happening in Europe at the time, the rise in anti-Semitism which culminated in the Holocaust. Freedom of speech uh, must be exercised with great responsibility. Um, an abuse of freedom of speech which would allow neo-Nazis or the Ku Klux Klan to make or spread racial hatred would not be tolerated in most Western uh, democracies. Yet faith or belief for those who hold them often runs much deeper than the color of their skin or their national identity. So it should be protected in the same way as the law protects and defends against racial prejudice. As mentioned earlier in 2006, a cartoon in Denmark which offended the sensitivities of Muslims right across the world. Again, we should remember we live in a global society today that's connected by the internet. Um, fueled the burning of uh, embassies and loss of life. Um, I think we have to be responsible in our use of freedom of speech. And we have to base our constitution on mutual respect. And um, in this multi-faith Ireland, mutual respect, not necessarily mutual understanding or agreement, is the basis of a stable and secure future for our country. And the blasphemy provision ensures that our constitution is not just a compendium of shared values, but rather a code or a framework by which a people of contrasting values can live together and work together in relative harmony. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, 
Well, there you have it. I mean, that, that is the set of external perspectives that we have uh, f for presentation to you. Again, my apologies. I'm sorry. I'm sure uh, F Professor Hannan is e more than sorry himself that he can't be here. But uh, he, as I said, he, he, he can't be here. So I think we're going to end this uh, at this point. Um, we have now, I think, uh, a short break. And we will resume for roundtable discussion. And after that, um, we will come back to, um, uh, we'll have a final Q&A after that roundtable discussion, because our experts uh, and indeed our advocates will, will still be here. But it'll be our experts that will be the subject of discussion, I think, or for questions. And then we will, at 4.45, attempt to uh, agree the ballot paper. We, ha we have had, we've some drafting done on it. We want to do refine it now over the next period of time so that we'd be able to present something to you at a quarter to five, hope for discussion and hopefully approval. So again, my thanks to all who spoke in this session and we, we break for 10 minutes. Thank you. <laughs>